classy singer-songwriter Lauren Flaherty and I'm here to tell you the top five things I learned in my CMJ recap. So for anyone who doesn't know, CMJ stands for College Music Journal. It's a trade periodical of up-and-coming bands that are doing very well on college radio and over 35 years they've been running this conference where they combine a combination of daytime panels about the music industry and where they think it's going to go and where it has been and some really awesome musical showcases that happen at night. This is my fourth time going and I'm proud to say that I'm still learning a lot and I'd like to tell you about it. So the biggest thing that I learned up in number one is that streaming is going to continue to get even bigger within the music industry. It's actually predicted to go up to 200% above what it currently is within a five year period. So that also means that downloads are gonna go down. That's estimated to go by maybe 40% for a drop. That's a big deal if you've been making some of your money that way. One of the biggest things to understand is that streaming is basically a European concept and in Europe, bands and artists and songwriters can qualify for grants from the government. That isn't really something that we have in the United States, so that can present a hardship for us. So it just makes it all the more important that uh, we can take advantage of the technology that we do have access to. And it also makes it important to check out the Songwriters Equity Act, which I'm going to include a link to in the comments. So another thing that was suggested since streaming is getting more and more popular is that you want to not just be playing shows but to take advantage of online technologies and consolidating your mailing list and things like that. So Kickstarter, fan funding, playing shows, doing anything you can to kind of bridge that gap is going to be important. Uh, you will still be able to sell CDs and maybe when you're watching this you're saying, dude, I sell a lot of CDs, whatever. That's amazing. But it is important to keep in mind that CDs are going to be kind of like a physical souvenir of maybe an awesome show that somebody went to of yours that they want to keep. It might not be how they're first exposed to your music. So keep making other souvenirs, you know, merch, t-shirts, sign posters, all of that is still good. Up in number two is the importance of having an online profile as a musician. You want to have your music very accessible online because it is possible that that might be the format where somebody finds out about your music through the first time is going to be on the internet. Uh, SoundCloud seems to be more popular than Bandcamp. In my experience, going to events in the New York area, people seem to prefer Bandcamp, but now they're converting over to SoundCloud, whereas I think LA has been more focused on SoundCloud to begin with. You know, you can debate and discuss that. I would say that as streaming gets to be more and more popular, it's going to be more important to have your ducks in a row with where your music can be found online. In my experience, having excellent online distribution was a complete game changer for me. When I was lucky enough to have two songs on Dance Moms, I got them through my back catalog. I didn't know about the placements until after they happened. And thank God, I just happened to have the CD that I put out in 2008 was still up through CD Baby's distribution. So my streams of when the songs were played on YouTube, those were taken care of, so those got monetized. Uh, it was already on iTunes, so I got paid for that. If someone makes a fan video, I got paid for that. So all of that was in addition to already having things uh, registered with BMI which is my PRO. So I would say that having good online distribution and you know tags for your video and having YouTube playlists of your songs, which are very popular, that's how a lot of people are finding out about stuff or they're making their own playlists. You know, YouTube is becoming kind of someone's personal radio, maybe even more than Pandora. I would say all of that stuff is super important. Um, with CD Baby, it cost me you know, say $35 to put this album up in 2008 and it didn't really start making money until a few years later and that was a one-time fee. 
So unlike TuneCore, where I would have had to have decided if I wanted to pay that fee every year, which I might not have, um, you know, I had already paid it, so it was already up. So when the money did start to come in, boom, there it was. So thank you, CD Baby. Happy customer. Number three is the importance of growing your fan base online and off. Things like YouTube, keep mentioning it, are just as important as playing songs in your hometown or having things available online for streaming or doing local collaborations. A lot of it's gonna be what you make of it. If you're just playing a gig at a coffee house down the corner, you know, that's your business, that's really cool. You can have a friend make a video of that footage and that can be something that you can put online or even just use to help you get additional gigs. I think that have people tape everything. You know, I mean, hey, if I was really insistent on having perfect video, I wouldn't be making this. But have people tape everything. But I think it is good to use some discretion with things. Um, I have a lot of friends who are bookers and they say that a lot of the time, even if they're really interested in the professional recordings that a band submits to them online, sometimes the video that actually comes in just looks like it's three people at a nightclub and they didn't pack the venue. Now, I've done enough gigs and gone to enough gigs that I know that there are a lot of great bands that sometimes do a gig where there's three people at the venue for you know a whole bunch of reasons. You can crop that footage. You can highlight that footage. You can manipulate that footage just to a reasonable extent where it's more about your music than, you know, maybe things that weren't under your control. Like, you know, there was a snowstorm that day. How, how was everybody going to know that that's why there weren't a ton of people there? Um, you can also look into hybrids, which would be things like the internet pro, uh, company concert window or stage it where you can play online shows or you can broadcast shows that you're currently playing. I think that's a cool thing. Um, when I used to work at Club Passim, I know they did a lot of stuff with Concert Window, and it can be a way to expand your audience. And again, you know, if you're taking you know, a smaller gig, why not try to reach more people? Uh, the biggest thing that they advised with that was just that it takes some time to get people into that stuff, so maybe play four or five shows from that, make sure you promote them in advance. And then just kind of go from there, see if it grows, but don't be too hard on yourself if you just do one and it just ends up being for three people. <laughs> Give it some time to grow. Number four is curation. So what that means is that basically the internet is giving us an unlimited inventory of music that is available. It's more than we can take in. Even if you love music so much, it is still more music than you can actually take in and absorb. And so at a certain point, if everybody's singing and everybody's playing, it, it starts to be too much. And so it's important to stand out. So that's where your curators come. So your curator's kind of like the person who decides what painting is actually gonna go up in an art museum and stuff like that. So they're kind of a gatekeeper. Um, you know, as someone who's DIY, I feel kind of uh, about this, but it was actually mentioned by someone who works for Sub Pop, which, you know, if you're familiar, is a really well-respected, cool indie label. So I said, all right, if it's cool enough for Sub Pop, I can keep an open mind about that. Um, but basically, it just means how are you going to get your music out there to people when everybody else is doing the same? So you can do things like online blogs, you know, try to get blog coverage. You know, this blogger has a good reputation, so if they mention you, it helps you stand out. You can also uh, include, you know, press reviews, things like that, and also just things that you can mention on your own. You know, you can tag the music with maybe a radio show it's been on, or it's someone that influenced the music. And you can also list shows and gigs, you know, things that you've done like that, just to help you have a little bit more credibility. Because if you are out there and putting a lot of time into things, it is important to stand out because that will make you feel better and get you new fans. So up in number five is something that's actually been reinforced to me at several conferences that I've gone to and it's a little bittersweet because we all love to go to these areas and daydream about what it would be like if we could 
you know, be huge in Europe or do this, that, the other thing. And like, oh man, I would totally eat lunch here every day. This brewery, I'd be there every day. Well, maybe not. But the biggest thing is that you don't actually have to move to the cities where these conferences are. Uh, so I live in downtown Boston. So for me, I can get into New York very easily. But if I'm trying to go to something in Los Angeles, that's a huge commitment. I love going to California. But for the price of going to California, I could get a whole EP recorded. So I have to think about stuff like that. Uh, the biggest thing that people really uh, reinforced at this is that record label people, publishing people, music directors, they all consider themselves to be very good at their jobs. And you know, a lot of them are really good at their jobs. And their job is to find new music. And again, they're using the internet, they're using word of mouth, they're using referrals. They're not necessarily using really expensive entertainment lawyers that you have to hire, although that can work if you know, you're know you like 90% of the way there. But they're gonna expect you to be the biggest thing in the pond that you're in. So if you are coming up in you know, a really specific town, you should be playing shows in that town that are sold out and then you, know, you can try to advance upon that. Or maybe your sound is a little bit different than the sound of your town, which is cool. That can be a really hip thing. But you should then have something that you can mention, you know, on YouTube or on, you know, anything that's available. So the good news is that, no, you don't have to feel like you can't go for something because you're not living in one of these specific areas. But the tricky news is that people are still gonna expect you to have something to talk about. So just double down on that and get whatever you can done. Thank you for listening to my recap of the five biggest things that I learned at CMJ. I'm gonna do two more videos about general conference do's and don'ts in this three-part series, and I hope you will check it out. Thank you.